Gorga. So today is the 22nd of February 2022. And on some communities, um, they consider this day to be a good day, an auspicious day. Because um, in the space of just one year, there's only one day. It has the 22nd of the second month. And in the Christian calendar, uh, it's also the 22nd year. And so this is a thought or a belief that people have. But if we're going to talk about the days and the nights and how those pass, then it's just the same as any other day. And 20 seconds is the same as the 23rd, the 24th, the 21st, of whichever month, it doesn't really matter. So in the morning the sun rises and sends light into this world, and then it passes through the sky until in the evening it descends. And we say this in line with conventions. But there's another way of speaking about it as well, and that is that the world spins. The world uh, spins around, and it's not really that the sun rises and sets, but it's more the rotation of the earth that gives that appearance um, of this uh, rising and setting of the sun. But really it's just the world that spins. And so it's like these aramanas, these sense impressions which come into the heart. And that really, the aramanas, they're just aramanas and they just do what they do. But the mind attaches to them following the delusion that's present there within the mind. And it clings to all of these sense impressions as being a self as being either me or you. And so from the time that we wake up in the morning, we have that feeling. There's this feeling of self, interpreting things in terms of self, of me and you. And this happens constantly until we fall asleep. Everything that we experience, we perceive in terms of self. And those with intelligence, they will take the self because they still have a self there, to develop and cultivate Bharami, these spiritual perfections, in line with the teachings of the Buddha. So he taught us to abandon that which is harmful, that which is unskillful. And through this, this is also developing Bharami as well. We take the self of ours to abandon um, any harmful kama, any harmful deed. In doing this through our actions of body and speech, this is what we call sila, or virtue. And even though we can abandon this uh, bad kama on that level, still it appears constantly within the heart. But we try to abandon that as well. And that which has yet to arise, we put effort into its not arising. That which has arisen already, we put effort into its abandonment. And this is right effort. There's also the right effort in terms of the skillful qualities. And those which have yet to arise, we put our efforts into their arising. Those which have arisen already, we care for them, we nourish them. So if we look at this, um, we can say that when we're doing this, we have two qualities, two dhammas there. Uh, there is hiri, this wholesome or intelligent um, shame of evil, and otapa, a fear of that. And these are two very important qualities, um, those that the devas, celestial beings, possess. And when we have this fear and shame of harmful acts, that's the equivalent of us being already firmly founded in sila, in virtue, which is the equivalent of us being a deva, that the mind is on a celestial level, that we don't kill, 
we don't break the precepts in any way. We don't lie. We don't uh, speak divisive speech. We don't drink alcohol and take intoxicants. And through doing this, then, we are abandoning uh, these unskillful deeds because we have a fear of their consequences. And we think to them, to ourselves, well, if I do this, then what will the result be? It'll be suffering, won't it? So even if these people are alone, but they have these qualities, um, then they will be firmly set in keeping their sila. And if there's a group of people who have good sila, then even if there are very valuable things that are around, no one will want them. And this is just like us um, staying, living in a celestial city. In those places in heaven, uh, there are many jewels, diamonds, gems, but no one wishes them, to have them because they belong to someone else. And they know that or they won't wish for anyone else's belongings because they know that no benefit will arise um, because their hearts have happiness already. And so they don't want any external things to give them happiness because they already have that happiness. And there's also danger in us getting these things as well. Because when we get them, then fear and attachment can arise. We can be concerned about them. And oftentimes, the more wealth we get, the more fear that we have. Fear that it'll run out, fear that it will get lost. So this is the suffering of people who have. And there's also the suffering of those who are lacking. They need to maintain their life, they need to look after this body, because this body is a heap of pain, of suffering. And if we don't have food to feed it, or clothes, or shelter, or medicine, um, then they can give us a lot of suffering. And people in this state, what they really want to do is to be able to overcome that kind of suffering. It's also often the case that People, when they get these um, physical possessions, when they get wealth, then they want to have more of it, and they want to keep it forever. And so there's no sea, no body of water, ocean, that is equivalent um, to one's desires. Because the heart gets something, it's never really enough. So Lumpur Cha once gave a teaching about this. It's kind of a Zen teaching. He said that people who have this craving, when they get something, they keep it, and then they go out to find even more, and it just never stops. They gain wealth, and then they keep it, they hoard it up, and they want more. They gain that, and they keep it, and they want more. And it's never enough, and they never stop. So someone who has a feeling of enoughness, that what they have is enough, this is a very rare person to find. So we need to have the Dhamma. Because these, we're always coming into contact with these sense impressions. So we also need to have these qualities of hiri and otapa, uh, the shame and fear of wrongdoing. It's when these sense impressions, these emotions appear, sometimes they can be extremely strong. And our mindfulness can be quite weak. Our sampajanya, our awareness, uh, can just have a little bit of energy to it. And it can feel overwhelming, like we're not able to do anything about the situation. <clears throat> An emotion comes up and we want to just let that out through our speech. We want to start fighting with others, to start winning out over them to start shouting at people, abusing them. But we also know that if we start fighting and we win, then we just build up the cycle of vengeance with that other person. And if we lose, then we ourselves suffer. We know that we don't want things to be this way. We don't want to fight with each other. But we also... 
feel like we can't do much about the situation, as that greed, hatred and delusion has come up already. And so the Buddha taught us in this case that we need to endure. He said, uh, kanti paramang tapo titika, that this quality of kanti, of patient endurance, is the highest austerity that burns out the defilements. So we should try it out, we should give it a go. Even though the heart might be very agitated, might be really hot, we use this power of kanti to keep that in and to really be cautious around that. Because uh, we know that if we let it out, problems could arise. So we can press our tongue against the roof of our mouth or hold water within our mouth and just endure. So this is forbearance on the level of generosity and of sila, of virtue. And we carry on training like this until our mindfulness gets better, until our barami grows and grows. And then we're able to defeat the defilements that are on that level. Defeat the defilements through the use of generosity and of sila. And if we can do that, then that shows that we do have a decent degree of patient endurance already. And we have these qualities of hiri and otipa. So if we can forbear like this, then we can bring about peace through our actions of body and speech. And so we um, are able to moderate our body and to keep our body in a relatively peaceful state. And some people, they find this really difficult to do. Um, that they get angry, and even though they can have control over their body, the anger can flash out of their eyes. And so the chilesas can um, come out through our eyes like this. But other people, they're able to maintain composure, stillness over their body. And that shows that they have a lot of forbearance, that they're really set in that. So this is an important quality. It's one of forbearance and also of serenity, serenity of body and of mind. So we carry on doing this, and as we do so, then our barami grows and grows. We train and develop our mindfulness and sampajanya, this clear comprehension. And these two qualities, sati, sampajanya, and these are qualities of wisdom. When we have mindfulness, then sampajanya, this clear awareness, clear comprehension, will come and help out. And mindfulness, it has a lot of benefit, um, more more benefit than any other quality, any other dhamma. Because in order to be virtuous, to keep our precepts, we need mindfulness. In order to be generous, we need mindfulness. So mindfulness is necessary in every single moment, and it's something that we should be training ourselves in. Just like how we're sitting here watching our breath, observing the in-breath and the out-breath. We have to have mindfulness over that, and through doing that we're developing this quality of sati. If we're sitting still like this and listening, then we have mindfulness. If we're speaking, then we have mindfulness. And um, when we receive any sense impressions, then we have mindfulness over those, and we're cautious around them. Whenever any of these sense impressions enter into the heart, we can see whether our hearts get shaken by them or not. And if we have good mindfulness and strong samadhi, then the heart won't be shaken by them. And we'll get the feeling that, ah, I really can do this. And we'll feel more and more at ease. Because before, All of these sense impressions, they come into the heart and the heart just runs after them. And all we experience is agitation, disease, suffering. And we've never been able to win out over them. And we know that it's not good. We try to tell our minds, don't go and chase after these things. But they don't believe us because they're just following the defilements. And so we need to be training and teaching these hearts of ours 
because a mind which is well trained brings happiness. It's something we need to train in, we need to develop a lot, to do it a lot, until the mind can come to a state of peace and stillness, where we're able to defeat the middling levels of defilements, and that which normally overpower uh, the heart, those of liking and disliking, of drowsiness, of restlessness, of uh, attaching to sensual pleasure, of doubt, of aversion. And these are the five things which arise very frequently within the mind. And the mind has been caught up with them, associated with them for such a long time now. These nivaranas, these hindrances, which obstruct peace, and they obstruct skillful qualities from arising within the mind. So things we need to put effort into abandoning. So through abandoning those, what we're doing is abandoning unskillful qualities. We're abandoning this papa. So there's no need to be afraid of them. Really, we set our hearts um, on this. So when any of these thoughts come up, then we just determine to not follow them. We know those thoughts, these unskillful thoughts. We have mindfulness there. And then we put effort into abandoning them, into letting them go, into uh, finding emptiness. And through that, the mind becomes more and more empty uh, through our training in samadhi, in sati, in uh, mindfulness. And then next we gain an understanding of all of the sense impressions, all of the things which appear within the heart, the things that are meritorious, things that are demeritorious. We see how they're all inconstant, they all change. Skillful qualities, unskillful qualities, they all change, none of them last. We're able to abandon all of them and rise above the world, which is rising above the sense impressions, lokutara. So we really want to know what the state is like. What's that like, being above the world? This is something that practitioners really want to experience. A heart which abides above the world. We really want to get there. We want to reach that state. And so we know that we shouldn't attach to any of these sense impressions. We shouldn't get involved in liking or disliking towards them. And when we're able to do that, then the mind abides above them. And through that, then we'll be able to see into the Dhamma. So this is something that we should try and give rise to uh, frequently. To be training to have mindfulness, to have good samadhi, so we're able to maintain control over our actions of body and speech. And then eventually we may gain knowledge, this clarity into the dhammas that we should know about, into this lokutara dhamma. You can see the body as being just a collection of these four elements. And see how it's something which is impermanent and stressful and not self. So throughout the day we should be contemplating like this. We still have this self, and so we use that self to create goodness and to abandon unskillful qualities. And so both of those become very firm within us, and we're able to realize lokutara as transcendence. And if we experience that, then the heart fills up with the Dhamma of the Buddha, and we see the truth. We perceive how all things in this world, all of its wealth, um, that if I were to gain that all for myself, it wouldn't have the same value as having a heart which understands the Dhamma. This is far better. Because all of the precious things in this world, all of its wealth, all of the gain and the praise, the status, the pleasure that we may obtain, 
None of that lasts because no conditioned phenomena, no sankhara can last. But still people living in the world, they need to get these things. That's necessary. And they get them um, in appropriate proportions to their barami. But when we get them, we should contemplate them as well and contemplate how they come in pairs. And that there's also loss, there's loss of status, there's censure, and there's pain. But whatever the case, we need to be building up our goodness constantly, we need to be contemplating a lot, seeing how the things in this world, they aren't mine, they don't belong to me trying to develop a mind which understands the Dhamma, which can see into anicca, dukkha, anatta. And then we'll be able, through that, um, to overcome all suffering. The mind can transcend the world. And this gives us immense value. So for all of us, we're fortunate that we have hearts that are set on this practice. We're all ones who are generous and virtuous already. So now it comes to meditation, this mental cultivation, and trying to bring up this kind of goodness. And through chanting, through sitting in meditation, through engaging in this practice, walking this path. So we should try and do this a lot. And as we carry on, then one day the results of all this effort will um, appear for us the mind will gather together, the path will come together in harmony. Sila, Samadhi and Panya will all gather clearly, and this is really amazing when this happens. And the mind becomes bright, it fills up with joy. And it's really unbelievable when this happens for us, that there can be this rapture that appears constantly throughout three days and nights. So perhaps sometimes we feel happiness and rapture, a lightness of body and mind arising when we sit in meditation. So then we can ask ourselves, well, what will that feel like if that happens all throughout the day and the night? And the mind feeling such contentment, this joy, this happiness, I'm flooding the heart until we feel like we don't want to eat any food because we're already filled with joy. And so Davis, and celestial beings, angels, they have this joy, joy in goodness. And Brahmas are nourished by this pity, by this joy, so they don't need any food. And the Devas have some celestial food, but the Brahmas don't eat because they are filled up with joy, and that joy is the food of a Brahma. So if we see the Dhamma, then the heart fills up with that and we see the results of our practice. We see the results of all the forbearance that we've put in, of all the effort that we've put in, of the uh, shame and fear that we have towards wrongdoing. The results of all the mindfulness and all of the clear comprehension that we've developed. So we train like this, we carry on on this path. As monastics, this is our way of showing our gratitude towards the Buddha, that we acknowledge his great and profound goodness, and we wish to repay that through our practice. If we're a child, um, then we know the goodness of our parents, of our mothers and our fathers, and they have these great qualities to them. And so this is the practice is our way of repaying them. And so all skillful things, meritorious things, we should do those. Abandon any harmful karma. And then be practicing, be training these minds, bringing them to a state of brightness. Be set on contemplating all things as being empty. Seeing how the things that are there, the things that exist, um, contemplate how within that there is that which isn't there, which doesn't exist. 
And then there's also within that which doesn't exist, there is also existence, there's also something there. So the things that exist, that are there, that we contemplate how they're anicca, dukkha, anatta, how they're inconstant, stressful, and not self, and how they don't belong to us. And so we see them as not really being there. But within the things, within that which isn't there, there is something, and that something is nibbana. But you can't say that nibbana is this or that. You can't really say that it's anywhere. But it does um, exist, and it's the highest happiness. And so it's not in any particular um, location. You can't say it's in any, any direction. You can't say that from here you have to go there or it's this far away. But it does exist. And so when we speak of it, it's like it's not there, but it really is there. And if it's there, you can wonder, well, why don't people talk about it? Why don't people um, explain it? But it's there within emptiness. It exists within emptiness. And with emptiness, you can't find any end to it. It doesn't have any of, um, boundaries or definitions. And so it's like when um, the heart doesn't have any sense impressions, uh, when the mind is empty. And then you can ask, well, where is the mind at that point? Where is that emptiness? But you can't say, you can't answer. And so may all of you contemplate in this line. And through that, you will see the Dhamma and attain to the Dhamma. And may you all set your hearts on this. <laughs>